everybody loves him. I could see this guy hosting a podcast about the weather. It's Jack Armstrong. Jack, how are you? <laughs> Guys, I'm doing great. Uh, I really enjoyed your uh, commentary the last few minutes. Uh, <laughs> riveting, absolutely riveting. <laughs> Do you know what we're saying, though, Jack? Like, there's a certain... You, you get on the road and you think, man, this is so glamorous, and then you go out after, and then you end up in a bar you shouldn't be at. You know the drill. You and Maddie <laughs> probably have to see you and Maddie all the time. Uh, yes, uh, there have been those moments, and people think it's, you know, because they only see game night. You know, they only see, like, the ball goes up at 7.30, and the game ends at 10, and all the hoopla. Uh, but they don't see the, you know, the late-night flights, and you you just uh, sleep deprived the entire time. And then uh, people just think you go to five star restaurants all the time when in fact you're uh, just hanging out sometimes in a, a local establishment trying to get a game on TV because you can't get it in your hotel room. So, uh, but you know what? I wouldn't trade it for anything. That's, so Jack, <laughs> what's your, what's your, uh, your worst hotel experience? Because you mentioned uh, hanging out. Uh, you, Getting a lobby is key, but I'm sure you've had a, a room where you walk in, you're like, what? What have we done? Well, a, a few times I've, uh, you know, you, uh, we've all had this happen. You know, you, you, you've been given the wrong, uh, you, they give you the key and you walk in, there's already someone staying in your yes. room. <laughs> That's a bit of a problem. Yep. Uh, I, I, it was interesting years ago, Chris Humphreys, who used to play for the Raptors, uh, he and I had the same exact luggage. So all the time, uh, he would take hit my bag to his room and I would take his bag to my room. So there was constantly confusion between the two of us uh, about where exactly our bags were. And then, I, you know, the worst thing always is when there's the fire drill. Uh, oh, I can yeah. remember many years ago, uh, you know, I, we were in the playoffs. I, I think it might have been Philadelphia and we're standing outside. Uh, because there's a fire drill and of course you know uh, some psycho fan uh, you know called the hotel and, and, and said that because they want you to uh, lose your sleep so they're ready uh, the, the opposing team's ready to kick your tail the next day so uh, yeah you get you get that kind of goofy stuff sometimes so it's pretty fun Jack you mentioned getting uh, a key to the wrong room I tell the story in Jay's first book in the forward how we uh, checked into a hotel in Sudbury and uh, I checked into my room, and then Jay did whatever he did. Five minutes after I checked into my room, who walked into mine? Jay. And I was, uh, I was standing there. <laughs> my, I was standing there in an underwear or my towel, and he didn't just close the door. He proceeded to have a conversation with me. Yeah, so. I mean, I didn't want to be impolite. <laughs> 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 well, that's why you're such good friends. That's, that's right. I mean, what are that's friends right. for, right? Exactly. I, think, I believe I had a cheese plate. He's like, oh, what's on the cheese plate? <laughs> <laughs> you he was probably quiet. jealous. You had the wine, the cheese plate, <laughs> you know, right. a few bit, bottles of beer on, in, a, in, the, in the wine uh, glass uh, on ice. That's how uh, they treat you in Sudbury. That, yeah, that's, it, that's the way you yes, get treated. Yes, I'm sure they do. In Sudbury. Jack, what's your favorite? You can't. Taking Brooklyn out of it because I know you have a soft spot for the borough in which you grew up, but on the road, favorite road city to travel to with Maddie when you're covering the Raptors? Wow. Uh, I, I, really, I, I really love San Francisco. Uh, there's a place called the Buena Vista Coffee Shop, uh, and it's not a coffee shop, it's a bar, but that's where the Irish coffee originated, and it's got an amazing view of the bay and the Golden Gate Bridge. And I, I'm a big runner, so uh, I, I run all along there. Uh, and then late in the afternoon, a day before a game, I always love dropping in there and having a few and the sun <laughs> sets. So I, I, I just think that's a great area. Uh, you know, North Beach for Italian food. Uh, you know, Boston I enjoy. I'm, I, I can't stand the Red Sox and the Patriots <laughs> and the Celtics, uh, but I, I love Boston. Being Irish, there's a lot of great Irish bars. Uh, so those would be a few that jump right off the page at me. How about a hidden gem of an NBA city where no one would ever pick that to go and visit? Absolutely, Portland, Oregon. Ah, uh, there you go. I, 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 you know, they have, they, uh, th there's an Irish pub there called the Kells. That's one of my all-time favorites. Uh, they have Irish music every night. So I go in there and I always enjoy that. Uh, I, and they have just, 
Uh, if you look year in, year out, if you read like Esquire or one of the uh, GQ, whatever, when they do the ratings of new uh, restaurants in North America, usually Portland will have one. Uh, they have a terrific, uh, eclectic uh, restaurant scene, and they have a ton of really cool microbreweries and, and, and cool pubs. So I would say Portland is probably a hidden gem. Uh, that, to me, uh, is, is the one that jumps off the page. I think that's an excellent answer. So, Jack, you've had a few days to digest what happened to the Raptors this season. Um, man, you know, when you really look back at it, it's been an incredible two years, hasn't it? Yeah, you know, it's actually been a great seven years. I mean, they've been in the playoffs seven years in a row. They've had the uh, you know best record in the NBA the last five. Uh, the last two have just been, uh, to your point, absolutely remarkable. And I'm not going to kid you, and I've said this before, I actually had more fun calling games this year than I did a year ago. I, I just thought last year, even though they won the title, uh, people were so uptight. Everything, like at, at times when, when you won, it was relief. It wasn't uh, euphoria yeah. and joy. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas I thought this year was more of a maybe like a collegiate experience. Uh, it was such a great group of guys, uh, you know, and, and I, I think they ate, exceeded expectations uh, above and beyond anything ever imagined. And uh, they were just a, a real joy to watch night in, night out. They found so different, so many different ways to win. Uh, they were so on demand at different part, parts during the season. So to me, uh, I, I had an incredible amount of fun this season as I did the year before. So it's been a fabulous run. Uh, to, to, not, to lose a Danny Green and a Kawhi Leonard and for this team to have the year that they had yeah. was pretty great. And then, unfortunately, they came up a little short against the Celtics, but uh, I had a lot of fun. And, Jack, I don't think you guys made it a secret that you were not in the bubble calling games. You were calling it from a production truck back in Oakville, Ontario. How was that experience? Because you're always courtside. Yeah, and, and it's difficult. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, being courtside is A1, the way to call a game because before the game, you have the opportunity to talk to coaches and players and refs, uh, pro scouts, advanced scouts, uh, media, broadcasters, you name it, and most importantly, fans. And you get a great flavor for uh, that particular game that night and, and just the state of the league and all the different things that are going on and trends. And I think that comes out then when you are on the air. Uh, I think when you're calling something from a, a quote-unquote bubble, and we had our own little bubble in Oakville, <laughs> it's kind of sterile. It, you know, it's sterile. And, and, that, and for me, I, I feed off of people. I feed off of personality and, and the emotion and then the enthusiasm of the game. And when you don't have that, uh, you really got to get yourself going every night. Uh, so I tried to do as much as I could during the playoffs. I stood during the games. I stood the entire game uh, while I called the game just to make sure I kept my energy up. Uh, but it's interesting. It's not the first time I've ever called games like this. Uh, I've done a lot over the years uh, for TSN. And prior to that, uh, when I used to work for Sportsnet, uh, same thing. You know, you call, you know, Canada trying to, uh, qualify for the Olympics or Canada in the World Championships or whatever the case may be. Uh, a funny story one time, I'll never forget, I called games uh, late morning uh, at TSN in Canada, I think it was in a qualifying tournament, and the games were in Brazil, but we didn't tell anybody that we weren't in Brazil. So the game ended, got my car, drove directly to a golf course in the GTA. You know how you pull up. And uh, the, the kid takes your bag out of your car and says, you know, you're on T3B. Uh, he goes, Mr. Armstrong, how did you get here from Brazil? <laughs> you know, he had, he had no idea. You know, so at least we told people we were in Oakville. Uh, but nonetheless, it was, it was not easy. So you really have to be fired up, geared up. Uh, there's no crowd to play off of. And your level of preparation has to be uh, at a high level. And you got to be really dialed into what's going on on the TV because uh, you're not close to people. So you have to really be able to have a sense of who that player is and what exactly is happening. You have no communication uh, with, with, with what's going on on the floor. 
Uh, you can't really, really read into what's being said in timeouts. So it makes it a lot more difficult. I wouldn't say it's guesswork, uh, but you really got to be on your P's and Q's. But if you didn't tell us and if we didn't know. Yeah, no one would know. We, you, you guys, guys are seamless. such pros. Yeah. yeah. So just so you know, we would never have known if well, we were told. Well, I appreciate that. You know, and, and, I, and I've had the opportunity to work with Matt. This is my 12th year work. We just finished our 12th season working together with the Raptors. I just finished my 22nd season with the Raptors. Wow. But prior to that, I, used to, I did WNBA with Matt. We did the New York Liberty together. And Matt and I did a lot of college basketball together. So uh, I've worked with Matt Devlin for, I think, 19, 20 years. So, uh, and then obviously the last 12 here in Toronto. Uh, so I, I think I have a really good chemistry with him, and we try to tag each other, just like you guys do. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important, as you know, when you have a partnership, uh, you know, you, I say something, uh, and, and I'm hoping that Matt hears what I'm saying and he tags it. I hear what he says. I try to tag it. We try to complement each other. Exactly. Let's talk about how you said 22 years ago you started broadcasting with Raptors. Who, Jack, who is the first person to see you and say, this kid from Brooklyn is going to be a star in Canada? <laughs> wow. Uh, I would say what happened was, uh, you know, I got fired when I was the head coach at Niagara. I had, I had a year left on my contract, and I said, I'm burnt out. I need a year away from coaching. And honestly, the only reason I did it was to take a year off from coaching, and I was going to go right back into coaching again. And as you know all the time, you look at all the NHL guys, Major League Baseball, NFL, CFL, NBA, whatever the case may be, a lot of times the analyst is that kind of next coach in waiting or next executive in waiting. So I figured, hey, I'll do a year of this, and then I'll either be an assistant in the NBA or go back and coach in the college game, whatever the case may be. Uh, so when I went for the, the, the Fan 590 in Toronto, had a radio analyst job, and the, uh, Nelson Millman, who was the program manager, uh, he hired Chuck Swirsky and I the same day. And basically what I did was I had all my college basketball contact, contacts call Nelson. And after a while, Nelson just said, hey, man, I surrender. I'll hire the guy. Even if he sucks, I'll take him. Doesn't matter. We're hiring you. And you worked and, with Swirsky. Uh, so I, I would say Nelson. I worked with Swirsky. I worked with Chuck for uh, 10 years. And, and now I've worked with Matt for 12, as well as Paul Jones on radio. And uh, I've been very fortunate to have incredible broadcast partners. Uh, and, and it's been an amazing run. And uh, so I'll be starting year 23 whenever uh, we start an NBA season again. So 22 years, and I, I pretty much know your answer. You are the person who can answer this or fill in the blank. Greatest Raptor of all time is... Kyle Lowry. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so it's not up for and debate. I will, I will say, I will say this. I, I have, I have seen Tracy McGrady, Vince Carter, Chris Bosh, Demar Derozan, Ka and Kawhi Leonard, and all of them, possibly, could be more talented than Kyle Lowry. Right. But nobody has gotten more out of their game uh, than Kyle Lowry. Now, Kyle Lowry, you know, he. We, we talk so much about his grit and his toughness, but Kyle Lowry is a very skilled player. He's off the charts intelligent, and he's a heck of a basketball player. It's all those other intangibles, and I always say he's the Wendell Clark of the Toronto Raptors. There's no question that he is that guy that every fan uh, can relate to with the lunch bucket and the yeah. hard hat, that you look at Kyle Lowry and you say, that guy personifies what it's all about. Um, Nick Nurse got a contract extension on Tuesday, the day we're taping this podcast. Uh, curious to get your thoughts on uh, on that. I, you know, it's kind of one of those things. Masai has all these things to do, Jack, this off season, and obviously decided that that was his number one priority. Well, smart move number one by Masai, uh, and and I'm sure uh, there'll be something. Uh, I, I would hope that Masai, Bobby Webster, their entire front office, uh, you know, I, I'm sure they're up next. They should be. They've done an amazing job. Uh, but I, here's my belief. Any good uh, sports organization, any good company, uh, when you have an elite talent in your midst, 
uh, and you have someone like a Nick Nurse or a Masai Ujiri or a Bobby Webster, whatever the case may be, and they're going into the last year of their contract, you look and say, this person is a big part of our success, and this is the time to reward them for that uh, because you want to continue that partnership long term. So to me, uh, it was a no-brainer uh, re-upping Nick Nurse. I think he's an elite coach. Uh, I think he has done you, – you know, we talked before about the seven years the Raptors have been in the playoffs. Five years, Nick was an assistant. Two years now as a head coach. So he's been synonymous with winning in Toronto. He's had a big part of it. Uh, he was an outstanding lieutenant uh, for Dwayne Casey, who did a, a fabulous job. And now Nick, in his own right, for two years – has done a great job. And I've always joked about it. I think it was the great Bum Phillips that said, a way, a Bum Phillips said about Don Shula, he can take his and beat yours. He can take yours and beat his. <laughs> I think he's that good a coach. I, 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 put him, I put him right at the top of the list of, of game managers, uh, guys that get the most out of their game. And think about it. Like a year ago, Danny Green, a lot of people were wondering how much he had left. Danny Green had a great year for the Raptors. Look at the big deal he got with the Lakers. Kawhi Leonard, you look at where his career was at based upon his injury issues in, in San Antonio. Kawhi Leonard had the best year of his career. You know, you look at down the line, Pascal Siakam, Fred Van Vliet, Norm Powell, OG Ananobi, Kyle Lowry, all these guys, they have all, now unfortunately for Pascal, he struggled in the playoffs. But nonetheless, when you look at the big picture of playing for Nick Nurse, everybody seems to get better. So, Jack, you were a coach. Uh, maybe you can get into the head of Nick Nurse. So, leading up to a game, during a, a game. A lousy one, by the way. <laughs> uh, during a game, after a game. It just must be plays, thinking of plays, the moment he goes to bed to the moment he gets up. He probably dreams about it because he seems like a guy who can uh, – he just got a lot of scheming, if that's the correct term, scheming that he does. Uh, Nick is what I would call uh, intellectually curious. Uh, he's, he's fascinated by looking at the game from a lot of different perspectives and hearing people's perspectives. Uh, he's inquisitive. Uh, I like that about him. Uh, I, I think he has his core beliefs, those foundational beliefs, that every coach has to hang his hat on, whether it be a Bill Belichick or a Greg Popovich or a Scotty Bowman, uh, whoever you might talk about. Nonetheless, uh, he also has that ability to think outside the box and not get married to any one thing because I think he recognizes as a coach, it's your job to uh, kind of put the scheme together based upon the talent level that your players have. Uh, so I think that's what he is always fascinated about is how can I find different ways uh, to put my players in the best position possible. And, uh, yeah, I think he's a guy that really works at it. Uh, you know, there'll be times where uh, I'll be sitting on the charter uh, and he'll walk by Matt and I usually sit together on the charter and he'll just stop and say, hey, what do you think? Or, you know, we did this tonight or that tonight and, He'll just pick your brain about something or yeah. ask for your perspective on how you're seeing something. Uh, so I like that about him. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say he's necessarily set in his ways. Uh, his ways are set by his talent level. Jack, we uh, sent out on Twitter a request from our listeners and viewers to uh, submit some questions for you. Some questions for you. So we have, Jack, several questions for you. And I'm going to give Dan the first one. This one is from Emma Listen. Emma Listen. And uh, this is the first question. And I have a feeling you get this question often. Okay, Jack. Um, so Emma wants to know, can you ask if he will MC my wedding? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's actually, I have done one, two, three. I've actually performed four weddings. Uh, like actually as a, an efficient, whatever yep. you want to call it, I stand there next to the judge. Uh, so I've been asked all, all of them actually in the GTA. <laughs> That's uh, amazing. And, and uh, MC, uh, MC, I've never MC'd a wedding. So like, mm -hmm. uh, what am I like? The, am I like the uh, Ed McMahon? I guess it would I be the, I'm dating myself here, but no, uh, no, I, I think so I'm that's like a the MC. Of, that's a pretty good analogy. Uh, the Dick Clark, if you will. Because I'm kind of, I'm, yeah. 
Dick Clark, yeah, like that, that would be, uh, so I kind of just show up and have a few beverages and kind of move the, the night along. Yeah, for exactly everybody. keep everything on time. So that's a yes to Emma then, right? You said that's a yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> well, uh, I guess your people will have to talk to her people. <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll figure that we'll, out. We'll make it work. Okay, Jack, this next one comes from a gentleman named Kyle Waters. And I like this question. It says, what is Jack's favorite Canadian beer? What is Jack's favorite Canadian beer? And then, and the second part of the question, Jack, your thoughts on the Caesar, the bloody Caesar. Uh, number one, uh, I like cold beer, any cold <laughs> beer. Uh, I, I'd prefer that, I'd prefer that over warm beer. Uh, you know, my motto, guys, is uh, they'll say, hey, Jack, would you like another beer? And I always say, the last time I said no to that question, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, who, who doesn't love uh, Molson? Now, obviously, living in western New York, uh, for whatever reason, Labatt Blue is like a big deal in Buffalo. Everybody drinks blue. Blue, blue light. Uh, I'm more of a Molson guy. Nice. Uh, I love my Molson. So uh, I, I would say uh, an ice cold Molson. Uh, and there's a lot of different variations of it. Uh, but I seem to like all of them as long as they're on ice. <laughs> and uh, a, a Caesars. You know, I, uh, when I tailgate at a Bills game, we normally get there about 8, 830. And, uh, you know, usually I started off with a, a either a Bloody Mary or a Caesar. Right. And then kind of downshift from there to a few cold Molsons and then a cigar before I walk in the stadium after a few hot dogs or burgers. Uh, I got to get myself prepped for the Bills game, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, 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 I'm totally fine. I, I'm, I'm comfortable having a Bloody Mary or a Caesar. They, uh, they Caesar, both work for me. Caesar kicks the Bloody Mary out of the park. I got to say that. <laughs> because of the the clam juice yeah the clam yeah the delicious taste of clams uh someone once said that's all that's the difference <laughs> okay jack here's the next one uh your thoughts on marcus smart being all defensive first team while leading the league in falls per game um the f huh. yeah okay we're gonna follow that up so start with that one you know what though I tell you what, he's kind of like a Kyle Lowry. If he's on your team, you absolutely love oh, the yeah. guy, and you're backing him up on every on every single one of those falls that he's had. Uh, and if he's on the other team, you just can't stand him because he's the ultimate flop artist. Uh, he's not a Vlade Divac, who was who, in my opinion, was the all-time flopper <laughs> when he played with the Kings. Uh, but I, I would say I, I would say that Marcus Smart is in that category. But I tell you what. If I had an opportunity to have him on my team or if I had the opportunity to coach the guy or uh, the good fortune to play with him, I I'd love to have him around me. The follow he's, he's, oh, I was just going to say, Jack, he's like, uh, he's like Patrick Beverly but with a three-point shot, basically. <laughs> Marcus Smart is the way I, I yeah. tune it, right? Yeah. No, I mean, and, and uh, you know, we, we, we're taping this right after game one of the Celtics heat, and obviously the heat won game one, but Marcus Smart uh, was terrific in that game shot the ball really well again from three. This is a guy, career-wise, that wasn't a great three-point shooter, and uh, he's really improved now down the stretch. Uh, the follow-up is why Lowry and Van Vliet didn't get votes, yet were top ten in defensive rating. Uh, that's a legitimate question. Uh, I think too often uh, people judge the book by the cover, and they're little guys, and they don't look like they impact the game as much. Uh, but Kyle Lowry is the best in the business taking charges. He is a terrific off-ball defender, as we know, with that skill. Uh, active hands, active feet. He makes impactful plays on the ball as well. He directs the ball where it's supposed to be go to, to go. Uh, Fred Van Vliet is a sensational on the ball, off the ball defender. He's got strong hands. His college coach, Greg Marshall, Wichita State, used an interesting term that I never heard before. He says he has heavy hands. You know, when he swipes down, uh, it's like old man strength. And uh, he is quick as can be. He's a tough guy to score on. Ask Steph Curry from last year's NBA Finals. I think both of those guys deserved a lot more respect defensively than they get. Jack, I love this question. And uh, it's kind of a hypothetical. What are your thoughts on Toronto's possible push 
to get Giannis and do you think it will actually happen? Well, uh, I would love if, if, if they get Giannis. I mean, Giannis is an incredible player with just the best is yet to come. That's the thing about him that uh, he's still as, as good as he is. He's still kind of scratching the surface on so many fronts offensively. I mean, we know he's a great uh, defensive player. Uh, shot blocker, on ball defender, uh, whatever, way, whatever way you want to look at it. Uh, he can rebound it. Uh, he's amazing going downhill to the basket. But he still has so many little facets of his game that f just fascinate me that I'm like, oh, my goodness, this kid's got a chance to be that much better. So, I mean, obviously Toronto and the other, every other team in the league is going to be lining up and hoping and praying uh, that you're, they're on his short list if he decides to leave Milwaukee. Uh, what are the reasonable expectations for, number one, him leaving Milwaukee and him coming to Toronto? Honestly, you know, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, obviously, you know, there's a relationship there that Masai Ujiri has with Giannis and his family, which I think is great. Uh, nonetheless, you know, the Bucks are going to have a lot to say about that in terms of uh, the offer that they make him and uh, the team they build around him this upcoming season. But uh, I think Toronto would be an amazing fit for him if he decided to come here. And he'd love and the I city. Welcome with him with open arms, but who knows what will happen. Yeah. I really don't know. Uh, this is a weird one. Uh, does he use actual face wash in the shower or just the remaining lather from his shampoo? Me? Yeah. Uh, I actually do a few things. I, I use uh, hand soap. To wash my face I use body wash to wash my body and then I use shampoo to shampoo my hair so uh, I got it covered on all three fronts <laughs> I, uh, I just realized I don't wash my uh, face I just stick it under the shower I didn't I, use soap on it that's why it looks the way it does yeah I know that's why it's falling off probably okay well, I'm doing when it you get right. it when you get as old as me and as ugly as me you need all the help hey you can now get. I don't know you're Jack. gorgeous man I think you look pretty good here's uh Okay, Jack, we're going to play a commercial. Uh, some of our uh, listeners across the country may have not have heard this country before, or this commercial before. Uh, Navesy, can you play this? This is a City of Toronto commercial starring the one and only Jack Armstrong. Come on! Get that garbage out of here! No, 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 no! Get that Get garbage, garbage out, out of here! here. Are you serious? Get that garbage out of here. Make the right call and recycle right. <laughs> First of all, I love, I love that the city of Toronto uh, had the fortitude, the ingenuity to, to contact you and put you in that commercial. I thought that was very clever. But the question for you, Jack, the question is, did you buy anything cool with that sweet city of Toronto recycling commercial money? That's from Corey Patterson. <laughs> <laughs> well, anytime you deal with a municipality, it's not there's there's one less zero than you think there is, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so I didn't get an opportunity. I didn't get an opportunity. I'm still working, you know. So uh, needless to say, it wasn't it wasn't that big. Uh, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun, and I tell you what, it was just a, a goofy, funny partnership. But I had so many people. Uh, they just remembered that, and they said, you know, like on a Sunday night or a Tuesday night when the garbage stays the next day, people actually are a little bit more conscious of making sure the recyclables are in the proper bin. And uh, I know the people of the city of Toronto, they were thrilled with it because the response that they got was off the charts and they felt like people were really buying into it. So, uh, I, you know, hopefully we could do it again down the road. Uh, I actually... Uh, I had some folks say to me that the, uh, the, the province of Ontario was interested uh, right before the pandemic about, uh, about thinking of, about something like that. So who knows? Maybe that it'll go there as well. But uh, uh, anytime we can do something uh, to make our community, uh, our, our country, our, our, or the earth that we all live together on a little bit better place to live, I'm all for it. You should do something with the raccoons in Toronto. Get those <laughs> raccoons out of here. <laughs> They're menaces, Jack. <laughs> they, they run the night here. They uh, really do. Okay, yeah. the next one is, my question for Jack is, other than Fred Van Vliet, 
who should be the priority to re-sign, Ibaka or Gasol? And thank you. Uh, I would, uh, Serge Ibaka, uh, the guy's coming off a career year. He's been a terrific player. He's played well in big games, and that to me is an important thing. Uh, the quality that you want, uh, that, that, that stuff's really, I value that a lot. How you play against good competition. You look at Ibaka, game seven last year against Philadelphia, uh, you know, he was, he was a big part. Everyone thinks of Kawhi's shot. Serge Ibaka had a big part in that win. Uh, you look at how he played as the series went along against Milwaukee. Big games he had against Golden State. Look at he was one of the better players for the Raptors in, in the second round uh, against the Celtics in this series. So to me, I think he's deserving. Uh, now, again, what the money is going to be and all that kind of stuff, that's for greater minds for me to decide. But uh, no doubt about it, I, I think Serge Ibaka, when you get past Fred Van Vliet, he would be that guy. Okay. Um, Jack, before we let you go, boy, there was a lot of a lot of talk about Pascal Siakam. You kind of touched on it briefly. Uh, just the bubble just wasn't the place for him. Uh, obviously, it just wasn't the Pascal that we were used to seeing. Was there one specific thing that you saw him doing uh, that was getting him off his game a little bit in the bubble, or was it just an unlucky streak for a player who has a ton of talent and uh, and still hasn't reached his ceiling? Well, I'll work my way back. I think, number one, the Celtics series, uh, they took away the Raptors' transition. I would say that's the biggest part of Pascal's game. And when you take away some of that, uh, you know, he's one of those guys, uh, uh, he's like a hockey player. When, when the score is 6-5 and it's free-flowing, it's a lot of skating and there's not a lot of checking, uh, he thrives in that, right? Uh, when, it, when it becomes more of a clutch and grab uh, in the corners kind of game, uh, his skill set uh, narrows a little bit. So give the Celtics credit for that. Now working your way back from their net series, uh, the eight regular season games, that type of thing. Uh, simply put, I, I just he didn't look comfortable. He didn't look confident. He looked kind of jumpy, like uh, he, he was uh, not sure of himself or his timing was off a little bit. And, you know, I, 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 again, I'm not on Twitter and all this stuff, so... I don't read any of it, uh, but I heard that people really went off on the young man. And I can tell you this, uh, Pascal Siakam is a wonderful young man, high character, hardworking, uh, tremendous attitude, and has grinded his, his way to where he's gotten. Unfortunately, he took a significant step back uh, in the Orlando experience. Uh, I have a lot of faith in him, in his work ethic, and his understanding of how to deal with not only success, because he's had some of that, but how to deal with failure and work his way back. And I have a lot of faith in the Raptor coaching staff and management that these guys have done an amazing job uh, when you talk about Siakam, Van Vliet, Powell, Ananobi, uh, DeLon Wright before that, uh, Jakob Pertle, all these different guys. They've done an amazing job developing guys and getting guys to the next notch. And I think he'll get back to that next notch next year. Uh, he is not a guy that's going to uh, fold his tent. He's not a guy that's going to wilt. Uh, he's going to work his way back. And I feel very confident saying that. Are you not going to ask the catchphrase question? Uh, I, I, I laughed at that one. We're, we're out of order. That's why. Okay. Uh, we'll ask. Uh, Jack, this is the last question. Then we're going to let you go. Did you ever consider goodbye as your catchphrase instead of hello? <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, hello. Uh, I, I'm sure you, you know. Hello came out of uh, uh, you know one of those things. You're growing up in New York, and a, a pretty girl goes by, and you go hello. Now, obviously, you can't say that anymore. It's uh, not <laughs> yeah. politically correct, and I and I respect that. But that's where it came from. So I don't use it for that. Mm -hmm. I use it for when I'm impressed by a, an amazing play. I go hello. And then get that garbage out of here came out of uh, playing on the schoolyard in Brooklyn. Uh, a guy would block your shot, and he, you know, or you would block a guy's shot and say, get that blank and blank out of here. And I'll never forget during a Raptor game one time, I was about to say that. Now, obviously, it would have been former Raptor broadcaster Jack Armstrong said, get that <laughs> blank and blank out of here. <laughs> so for whatever reason, I said garbage. And uh, it just stuck. And people were like, hey, man, that's pure gold. I love that. 
Uh, so that's where hello and gob get that garbage out of here came from. Uh, if you got a third thing for me, you know, Goodbye. I, I kind of like well, the Boucher. Radio I, Brent I just gave it to you. Bonjour. Goodbye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and we should end Bonjour. it on that. There it is. There it is. Jack, uh, thanks for taking the time for us. Uh, enjoy some well-deserved time off with your family and, uh, and uh, all the best to you. And thanks again. We just really appreciate you taking uh, some time for us here because everyone loves you so much. So uh, all the best to you in the offseason. We'll see you next season. I love you guys. Have a great night. And it's always a pleasure coming on with you. And uh, all the best. Thank love you, buddy. Go Bills. Goodbye. <laughs> Go Bills. <laughs>